Welcome to another edition of Return to the Word Radio with Bible teacher Mark Fontecchio. Advancing the message of God's amazing grace through the teaching of God's Word. And now with today's message, here is our teacher. Today we're going to wrap up the third chapter in the Gospel of John. John 3 is before us and we start our text with verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Enon, near Salem, because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, He who is with you beyond the Jordan to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I'm not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. The Father loves the Son and has given all things into his hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. I'm confident that some of you know the true account of John Harper. John Harper was on the Titanic when it went down in the year 1912. Try to remember that the Titanic was built as a luxury liner. Some wealthy people were on board, men of prestige. But John Harper, most people at that time had never heard of him. An ordinary man, a pastor from Scotland, only 40 years old. John had been serving as a pastor for 15 years when Moody Memorial Church in Chicago had invited him to come and preach. He accepted the invitation and booked himself on the maiden voyage of the Titanic. His thinking at the time was that he would use the time crossing the ocean to study. But John had a bit of a problem staying in his room and studying because he had such a heart for the people. It's said that the night before the Titanic sank that John Harper was on the deck of the ship earnestly pleading with a person to come to know Christ. This was a man who had given his life to see people come to know Jesus Christ. That famous night when the ship struck that iceberg, he woke up from the impact. He started making his way to the lifeboats and he realized right away there was not enough room for everyone. Witnesses reported that he started going from deck to deck, crying out, women and children and the unsaved to the lifeboats. He kept yelling out, let's get the non-Christians on first. It's hard to imagine the panic that must have set in on board the Titanic. John Harper knew his salvation was secure, so he didn't even try to get a spot on a lifeboat. This was a man that was confident in his faith, confident of his life in Christ. And when the ship went down, John Harper was one of many that was cast into the freezing waters. He hung on to a wooden piece of debris floating in the water. And when the ship sank, it created huge swirling currents in the water, causing some of the people to be brought close together and then flung back apart. One man was brought in close to John Harper because of the current, and John cried out to the man, Sir, are you a Christian? The man simply answered, No. And then the current took the man back out into the darkness again. But a few minutes later, that same man was brought back close to John. And so John asked him again, Sir, are you saved yet? Have you accepted Christ? And the man said, No, I cannot honestly say that I am. 
Apparently, that was the last thing that John Harper ever said because he lost his grip on the piece of debris that he was holding onto and sank down into the depths of the Atlantic Ocean and died. The man that John Harper was pleading with to become a Christian in his last few moments of life was one of the very few who was plucked out of the water by one of the lifeboats that came back. He did come to faith in Christ that night, settled in Ontario, Canada. This man was often asked to speak and give his testimony, and he would proudly step up and say, I am John Harper's last convert. John Harper, John the Baptist, two men committed right to the end to pointing people to Jesus Christ, both men that we can learn much from. There had not been a prophet in Israel for over 400 years. God had been silent. The people longed for a word from him, and they longed for the Messiah. John the Baptist, born at the right time, a prophet of God, echoing the law in the prophets and proclaiming the impending fulfillment of the messianic prophecies of Scripture. There's a progression that is present in the Gospel of John. Consider the witness of John the Baptist. I am not the Christ. I have been sent before him, a friend of the bridegroom. He must increase. He comes from above. He's above all things. He's sent and blessed by the Father. He is the Son. John the Baptist stood ready to testify of the Christ. But one of the truths that's presented in the Bible is that people have not changed over the last 6,000 years. John 3 shows us this well. Let's skip ahead for a moment to Mark 9. Mark 9, 33 takes us to two years after the scene of John 3. The disciples are on the road to Capernaum having an argument over who is the greatest. Jesus asked them what they had been discussing, and the disciples were too embarrassed to admit it. But Jesus knows. He tells them that to be first, it meant that they had to be willing to be last. It was not his first lesson to his disciples about being servants. John, the disciple of Jesus, is there. He's taking this all in. He's been a part of the argument about greatness. It was John and his brother who had requested first-class seats in the kingdom. And so notice the response of John in verse 38. John answered him saying, Teacher, we saw someone who does not follow us casting out demons in your name, and we forbade him because he does not follow us. He's not one of us. Can you hear what he's saying? He's not in the group. It's a pride issue. We do the same thing today. We break into groups wondering how anyone outside of our group could be right with God. Jealousy sets in. When the church down the road grows faster, grows bigger, and reaches more people than us. Why did Cain kill Abel? Jealousy. Let me ask you, how many marriages have been destroyed by the drive to be first instead of the commitment to be a servant? How many friendships have ended because of envy, jealousy? Proverbs 27.4, who is able to stand before jealousy? Because of jealousy, Joseph's brother sold him into slavery. Because of jealousy, the religious leaders wanted to kill Jesus. Satan himself was discontent with the plan of God and insisted on having the prominence. This same type of pride is what we find in the disciples of John the Baptist. But in John, we see a man with a humble commitment to the will and the plan of God for his life. Think of the words of Christ in Matthew 11. Among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. Notice how our text starts out back in the Gospel of John with verse 22. After these things, Jesus and his disciples came into the land of Judea, and there he remained with them and baptized. Now John also was baptizing in Enon near Salim because there was much water there. And they came and were baptized, for John had not yet been thrown into prison. The Apostle John simply begins with these words, after these things. This took place sometime after the discussion between Jesus and Nicodemus in Jerusalem. Jesus had been in Jerusalem, but now the scene shifts. This is taking place in the Judean countryside. Matthew, Mark, and Luke do not teach us about the baptism ministry of Jesus, but John does. 
And down in chapter 4, we're going to learn that Jesus himself did not actually baptize. It was the disciples who baptized. But according to Mark 1, the 12 disciples had not yet been commissioned. They hadn't been called to full-time ministry. So here in our text, this may or may not have been the men that went on to become his 12 disciples. This was water baptism. This was immersion. This was baptism for repentance. The text reads that Jesus remained there. Jesus spent some time there. But look again at verse 23. Notice the details. John the Baptist was baptizing in Enon near Salem because there was much water there. Halfway down the Jordan River between the Sea of Galilee and the Dead Sea. Enon means springs. John teaches us this, a place of many waters. The valley there is big enough to hold the crowds that were still coming to listen to John the Baptist. Follow the narrative. Jesus and his disciples moved to the Judean countryside, to the northern part of Judea. John the Baptist nearby, not that far apart. And even though the Messiah of Israel had come, people were still plugging into the ministry of John the Baptist. Continued action here. They kept coming and continued to be baptized. But don't underestimate the importance and the impact of the ministry of John the Baptist. In Acts 19, when the Apostle Paul came to Ephesus 20 years after the resurrection of Christ, he found men who still at that point, 20 years later, were following the teaching of John the Baptist. But let us take a minute and understand what is taking place with the baptism of John. This wasn't the church age, and this was a little unusual for the people of Israel. The Jews had the ceremonial washings to prepare themselves for worship. But John's baptism was a little different. This was a one-time baptism of repentance to symbolize and testify that a person had prepared their heart for the coming Holy One of Israel. Listen to Luke 7. The people, and even the tax collectors, they acknowledged God's justice, having been baptized with the baptism of John. But the Pharisees, And the lawyers rejected God's purpose for themselves, not having been baptized by John. John, the forerunner of the Christ, not thrown into prison yet, still pointing people to the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was the first year of the Lord's public ministry. In fact, the first five chapters of John all focus on this first year of ministry of Christ. And if it were not for this section of scripture, we would have little record of this time from the Lord's baptism to the time that John the Baptist was thrown into prison. But verse 25 sheds a little more light on the contention that took place. Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, He who is with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you have testified, behold, he is baptizing, and all are coming to him. John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Now, verse 25 has some disagreement whether this was one Jew or Jews, plural, that had this dispute with John's disciples. The heart of the issue was how did John's baptism fit in with the purification rituals. And when the question of John's baptism came up, this led to the report of Jesus baptizing just down the road. And so you can see the panic in verse 26 on the part of the disciples of John. Rabbi, Jesus, the one with you beyond the Jordan. Notice the wording. Behold, he is baptizing and all are coming to him. We need to do something. We need to do something right now. Full blown jealousy has set in. Was everyone following Jesus? Obviously not. Verse 23 just told us people were still coming to be baptized by John the Baptist. But this is what we do when we get down, when we get jealous. There should have been excitement that the Messiah had come, but out of ignorance, these men did not even seem to recognize who Jesus was. They just simply referred to him as he who is with you and the one to whom you have testified. Nothing about Jesus being the Lamb of God or the Son of God. Faith, in our understanding of the Scriptures, it doesn't always pass on to those around us. John the Baptist 
had disciples on the wrong path. Think of it this way. What were these men looking for? Did they honestly want John to condemn the ministry of Jesus? Did they want John to defend his own ministry? I think his response must have shook them. Verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. Philadelphia Eagle running back Herb Lusk, I bet you've never heard of him, but he's actually the first one back in 1977 that did something no one had ever done before in the NFL. After running 70 yards for a touchdown, he took a knee and he prayed. Nowadays, a lot of people do it, but Herb didn't think anything about it. It was just a humble and honest moment between him and God. But that's not why we mention him. That is not why we bring him up. When Herb was drafted by the Eagles, he had already decided he would only play for three years. And then he would devote the rest of his life to serving Christ in full-time ministry. But when the fourth year rolled around, he reported to training camp and the real battle began. Because the lure and the temptation to keep playing was bigger than he realized it would be. The money that he could make, the fame, the popularity was not easy to forget. And then, one day in training camp, he woke up in his dorm room. He got on his knees and he said from that moment on, he knew what he had to do. He knew he was done. He walked away from pro football. He went back to school. And a couple of years later, he became the pastor of Greater Exodus Baptist Church with a membership of less than two dozen people and a rundown building. That's what a hero of the faith looks like. That's what a man of God looks like who is committed to the will of God in his life. Because when fame, fortune, and pride settles in, the decision must come, God's will or ours. You see, John the Baptist understood that everyone serves at God's pleasure and contentment should come in serving him. In verse 27, we must agree that this is pointing to the sovereignty of God in the role of the Son of God on earth. It's a general statement of truth, but to what end? Who was John to complain about the role that God had for him? That's the context of this verse. Who are we to complain about what God has in store for each of us? For John the Baptist to sit back and wish that he was someone else, to wish that God had a different role for him, would have been to covet something that did not belong to him. But how much worse would this be when the other person in question was the Messiah himself? I mean, to covet the ministry of the Messiah would be to wipe away the great ministry that God had given to John. The temptation that every one of us faces is to be disgruntled with the role that we have in the ministry of God. But that is nothing more than pride, thinking that we know better than God. John didn't want to have the ministry of the Messiah. He didn't want the fame. He wanted to serve. John came as a witness, not to himself, but to Christ. Being sent by God meant that he had a specific role, a role to be faithful to the Son. John the Baptist continues starting in verse 28. You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. Notice, he who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. Quite a different reaction from John the Baptist than what we see from his disciples. John wasn't taken off guard. John wasn't bothered by any of this. John had always made it clear to his disciples that he was not the Christ. Remember back to what he said in verse 23 of chapter 1. I am the voice of one crying in the wilderness. What? Make straight the way of the Lord. John meant what he said because he knew and he understood that God the Son, the Messiah, had come, and John was the herald of the Messiah. John was content with the role that God had for him. What a contrast, because all throughout the Gospels, we see the Pharisees worried about their loss of prestige among the people. And how many ministries do we see today always wanting bigger buildings, more programs, and men wanting more glory for themselves? 
John wanted the Son of God to be glorified, and he simply wanted to remain faithful to the work that God had entrusted to him. The point of verse 29 was for John to clarify to his disciples the relationship he had with the Messiah. The best man, or the friend of the bridegroom, he didn't marry the bride. The bride of Christ did not belong to John. The bride belongs to Christ. The friend of the bridegroom always had a prominent role in the wedding, but he took his joy from seeing the groom united with the bride. And once his role was done, he would willingly and graciously fade from the picture. The best man had a prominent position, but he was not center stage. John understood that this was his role. He had the joy of seeing Christ come for his people, but his joy was complete now that Christ had come. John knew the days before him were numbered. His disciples didn't like it, but John knew the arrival of Christ was actually the day he'd been working for. And he understood the principle that the people belonged to Christ, not to him. John wasn't ignorant of all the Old Testament texts that refer to Yahweh as the husband of Israel. Isaiah 62, Jeremiah 2, and Hosea 2. John was telling his disciples that the one he had introduced to the faithful remnant of Israel is the king of Israel. He is their Messiah. It was his great joy that the people were turning to follow their king, the Lord Jesus Christ. John was trying to introduce the nation of Israel to the groom. But once the Lord was rejected, the church would be born. The church is now betrothed to Christ. Revelation 21.9 speaks of the church as the bride, the lamb's wife. Remember what we've seen before, that in Revelation 19, we have the marriage supper of the lamb. Verse 7 of that chapter records, Let us be glad and rejoice and give him glory, for the marriage of the lamb has come, and his wife has made herself ready. According to the wording of Revelation 19, at the marriage supper of the Lamb, there will be two groups of people, those who make up the bride of Christ and the friends of the bridegroom, those who are called to witness the marriage supper of the Lamb. How did John the Baptist refer to himself? Not as the bride, not as the bridegroom, but as a friend of the bridegroom. The beautiful picture that we see in Revelation 19 is of the bride of Christ united to the Lord Jesus Christ. But John the Baptist was killed before the birth of the church. John the Baptist was not a part of the church. He was not a part of the bride of Christ. So John, along with the Old Testament saints, they are friends of the bridegroom that will witness the marriage supper of the Lamb. But they are not the bride of Christ. And therefore, John knew that all of the disciples, even the ones that were following John at this point in time, they all belonged to the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is what brought him joy as a friend of the bridegroom, when he heard the voice of the bridegroom coming for his bride. In verse 30, we see this beautiful statement, he must increase, but I must decrease. This was the will of God for John, that he must decrease, his ministry would decrease. John knew it. But this humble servant of the Lord took great joy from seeing the ministry of the Son of God increase. John found his joy not by trying to compete with Jesus, but by embracing the will of God in his life. He must increase, but I must decrease. John the Baptist knew that he must now fade into the background. These are the last recorded words that we have from John the Baptist before he was put into prison. The famous missionary, William Carey, had the right attitude. This same attitude is that of John. When he was close to death, he said to a friend, When I am gone, don't talk about William Carey. Talk about William Carey's Savior. I desire that Christ alone might be magnified. The rest of chapter 3, it's not entirely clear whether these are still the words of John the Baptist or they could be the reflective words of the Apostle John as he looked back at these events many years later. Take a look with me starting now in verse 31. He who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all. And what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. He who has received his testimony has certified that God 
is true. Verse 31 is the contrast between John the Baptist and God the Son. I think what we have is the explanation of why Jesus, the incarnate word, must become greater. The reason, according to verse 31, is because Jesus is from above all, and therefore he is above all. This is pointing to the preeminence of Christ. Men are from the earth, limited by our nature. John the Baptist was the greatest man born of women, Matthew 11. But he was still just a man from the earth. Jesus, God the Son, coming down from heaven and taking on human form. John the Baptist was one that speaks of the earth. John could only speak what he knew. Sure, he could call for people to be baptized. Sure, he could call for people to repent and prepare their hearts for the coming Messiah. But he could not reveal the very things of heaven. John the Baptist could not give men new life from above. That itself is a work of God. John the Baptist could not give men the baptism of the Spirit, because when John the Baptist spoke of the baptism of the Holy Spirit, it was in reference to the Messiah, that the Messiah would come and baptize with the Spirit. John the Baptist was sent by God, but he was not the Son of God. This is why we see this statement, he who comes from heaven is above all. Verse 32, speaking of the Son of God, and what he has seen and heard, that he testifies, and no one receives his testimony. This is speaking of the Son of God in heaven. Only the Son of God can speak of what he has seen and heard in heaven. Jesus Christ knows the eternal counsels of God. God himself came to this earth, but yet, by and large, men continue to reject his testimony. Way before time even began, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Spirit decided to act in creation. They accepted the truth that if they acted in creation and made a man and gave him intellect, emotions, and free will, that they would have to act in redemption. Jesus was there. So when we read in the Gospel of John that Jesus was talking about conversations that he had with his Father in heaven, we could take his word for it because he was speaking of things he had seen and had heard. He was speaking as one from above. In verse 32, no one receives his testimony. This is hyperbole, a figure of speech designed to point out the tragic rejection by the men and women of the world of the Lord Jesus Christ. The nation of Israel had waited for 400 years for a revelation from God, much longer for the coming of the promised Messiah. The prophets could not have been more clear. When John the Baptist pointed the way to the Messiah, you would expect an avalanche of faith from the nation of Israel, but few responded. Verse 33 offers the other side for those who do accept the testimony of Jesus of what he has seen and heard. The believer in Christ has certified that God is true, not just that Christ is true, but that God is true, including God the Father who sent the Son. The idea behind this statement is that of confirming a legal document by putting an official seal on it. Jesus is God's perfect witness. His words are absolute truth. When Jesus speaks, it is God who speaks. Those who receive the witness of Jesus are testifying of the truthfulness of God. Verse 34, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. Here we see the work of the triune God. God the Father sent God the Son. God the Son speaks the words of the Father. Throughout redemptive history, God has spoken to his people through his messengers. Hebrews 1, God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets, has in these last days spoken to us by his Son. In the human nature of Jesus, the means by which he imparted the words of God was by the Spirit of God. We need to keep in mind that the Jewish rabbis taught that when God spoke through the prophets in the Old Testament, he gave to the prophets the measure of the Spirit of God that was required for the work that God had for them. They received the Spirit for a limited time, for a specific work that they were called to. The point to be understood here is that Jesus received the Spirit of God without limit. This makes me think of the prophecy of Isaiah 11 of the coming of Christ. The spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Jesus received the full measure of the spirit of God 
And then verses 35 and 36 teach, The Father loves the Son and has given all things into His hand. He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. Don't underestimate the love of the Father and the Son. God the Father has placed the reality of salvation, the authority to give life and to judge into the hands of the Son. And we are reminded again of the two choices before every man, faith in the Son which leads to life, or the wrath of God for those that reject the Son. The wrath of God is the personal response of a holy God who comes to the world that he created, the world living in rebellion, and he finds few who want anything to do with him. Verse 18 already taught us believers in Christ already now partake in the eternal life that comes from God the Son, and those who reject Christ already stand condemned, awaiting the wrath of God. I read the transcript from an interesting interview this past week. The religion reporter from a newspaper was asking a person in her town about his faith. She didn't ask just a couple of basic questions. She started off by asking him point blank what he believed. And like most people, he answered that he was a Christian. She wasn't satisfied with that. Many people would accept such a statement, but this reporter didn't. She pressed further. She asked him about the content of his belief. He responded that he had a deep faith. He said he draws from the Christian faith. His grandfather was a Baptist and his grandmother was a Methodist. Then he went on to tell the reporter that he was a regular attender at the same local church where he had committed himself to Christ many years before. That sparked another question from the reporter. She asked, did you actually go up for an altar call? Yes, absolutely. Again, the reporter, so you got yourself born again? Answer, yeah. The interview went on and he confessed to regular prayer. He talked about maintaining his moral compass, doing the right thing, reading the Bible, following the guidance and teaching of his pastor. He even talked about faith and his personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Sounds perfect. Sounds like a believer in Christ. But this reporter didn't stop there. She wanted to know what he really believed, so she asked, Who is Jesus to you? Part of his answer was that Jesus is a historical figure to him, one that I think is powerful precisely because he serves as that means of reaching something higher, and he's also a wonderful teacher. The prayer that he calls his ongoing conversation with God, he describes it like this. Throughout the day, I'm constantly asking myself questions about what I'm doing why I'm doing it. Those are the conversations I'm having internally. I'm measuring my actions against that inner voice that for me at least is audible, is active. It tells me where I think I'm on track and where I think I'm off track. Things got really blurry when he talked about the content of his belief. He said that he is suspicious of dogma. He's uncomfortable with the concept of absolute truth. He doesn't believe that his faith is transferable to others. Instead, he believes in what he calls tolerance. He said religion at its best comes with a big dose of doubt. I'm suspicious of too much certainty. He flat out denies that people will go to hell if they don't believe in Jesus. He dodges the question about heaven by saying whether the reward is in the here and now or in the hereafter, the aligning of myself to my faith and my values is a good thing. He did say that he believed in sin, but his definition of sin was far from biblical. He said that sin is being out of alignment with my values. And the consequence of sin is, if I'm true to myself and my faith, that is its own reward. And when I'm not true to it, it's its own punishment. And listen to this part. I believe that there are many paths to the same place, and that is a belief that there is a higher power, a belief that we are connected as a people. This was the interview conducted by a Chicago Sun-Times reporter with then State Senator Barack Obama. Mankind has only two options, to either trust the Son or to reject the Son. John in verse 36 
actually spoke of unbelief as disobedience to God. That's the wording that is used. Because there is one thing that God will not forgive. It is to have his son treated with contempt, disbelief, or indifference. To redefine faith and salvation in the Son of God, which is common in this day, it's just another testimony of unbelief. It is not just faith alone that saves. Faith must meet the right object. Faith alone in Christ alone, that Christ described in God's word, his death and resurrection for our sins. When faith meets the right object, the result is salvation. The problem is that pride comes in. Pride leads men to define God on their own terms. Pride can ruin lives, ruin reputations, split churches, and lead souls down a dark, desperate path. Share your faith, but define your faith. Be specific. Ask questions. And learn the lesson of humility found in John, always believing and always proclaiming the living Word of God. If you find this broadcast helpful to your faith, please remember that we are listener-supported. We don't spend a lot of time asking for money, but we do depend on your prayers and support to cover our costs. Even smaller monthly donations help us to tell others of God's amazing grace. You can find out more on returntotheword.com. Return to the Word Ministries is committed to teaching the full counsel of God's Word and the gospel of Jesus Christ. For more about our ministry, please visit returntotheword.com. Return to the Word is a faith ministry. This means we freely distribute the teaching of the Word of God over the air and online. We do this without charge. If you feel led to support the ministry with a donation to help cover these costs, you may do so on our website, returntotheword.com, or by mailing a donation to Return to the Word, P.O. Box 879259, Wasilla, Alaska, 99687. Thanks for listening, and we pray that the Word of God will be a lamp unto your feet and a light unto your path. Join us next time for another edition of Return to the Word.